welcome to tonight's stream of live sessions with a GM. I'm that GM and you're the stream that's live. I'm not sure. Anyway, good and good welcoming. Hello, English words stringing together a sentence put together yourself must do for apparently not I can match. I don't know what was going on there. Anyway, hello to everybody. See, chat is uh, getting ready to go ahead. Um, oh, it's going ahead. Uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, my hand doesn't go that far. It doesn't go that far. Anyway, it's good to see you all here on this rather chilly evening. There's been, I beg your pardon, there's been snow in Tokyo. There was sleet here in London. So uh, across the globe, there was a cold twist uh, wherever you happen to be, I hope you are warm and uh, comfortable and cozy. And as uh, Gamer War Tanker Eight Eight says, uh, time to get the popcorn. Well, that's certainly a good time to get the popcorn. I've got the coffee, so there you are. <clears throat> now uh, we've got some interesting uh, people. Uh, bon, uh, bon journée, bon, bon personne. Oh, good grief, Lance. Uh, Lance Pickett trying to teach me French that didn't work very well. Um, Coke says Warp Enigma. Yeah, why not? Why not? There is no snow in Norway. That seems uh, it seems almost contradictory, doesn't it? Drizzle here on the San Francisco coast, says Roger B. Wow. Well, uh, there you are. I'd love to visit San Francisco one day. Never got there. Never got there. Didn't get high enough when I was doing my uh, wonderful journey across that side of America. San Diego, Los Angeles, and that's kind of where it stopped. Uh, no snow in Finland either, Desmanir. Well, that's sad. That's sad. A friend of mine has actually just moved to Finland. Um, she and her husband, as a matter of fact, got me into LARPing uh, many, many, many moons ago. And uh, what a pleasure that was. Very grateful. Edward Horseman, how's the weather in the Netherlands? Um, Hand it schnee of nicht, nit, 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 no, nit is, is Russian for no. Hand it schnee, nit, 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 I don't know. Anyway, and Canada, um, we're in the positives. Well, there we go, traffic jam, that's lovely. Uh, middling in Milwaukee, so there we are, there we are. Um, yeah, um, anyway, all right, so we're not here to talk about the weather. We're not here to talk about the weather. We're here to talk about all sorts of cool and wonderful things. Let's kick off with something from one of the sponsors of today's show. Now, we have seen them before, and um, when I showcased their products, everyone went ooh and ah. Well, I've got something more for everyone to go ooh and ah over, and I, I spoke about it because I thought that they had sent me what they had sent me, but they actually... There was a second package which arrived a little bit later on, a couple of weeks actually, after we spoke about it. So we're talking about Mon <laughs> Master Monk Gaming. I don't know what's wrong with my words these days. So Master Monk Gaming have got this box set called the Oracle Dice coming soon to a Kickstarter near you. And I sort of went, well, these look very nice. I wish we could, we should, you know, we could have something to show off because I quite like the, in the, the inlay panel. And lo and behold, if it didn't arrive and here it is i love these brown packages i i have to say i really do uh like these brown packages so if i slide it open the box comes out now they didn't send me the pine version this time they sent me the i think it's cherry or, or something along those lines um and then i put a set of dice in it so you can see now this is what i particularly like is if you're like me and you've got dm dice you've got gaming dice and you've got dice for surviving and you've got cthulhu dice and dnd &D dice and star wars you know you I like these little panels, these little insets, because then you can see what they are. So you sort of stack them up on top of each other, and you can slide it out and go, oh, yeah, that's the, these are my D&D uh, &D dice, or these are this, or, 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 or the next thing. So the magnet that they use, whatever magnets are, are holding this lid on, are, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. So this is the uh, Master Monk Oracle box set, dice box set, Oracle dice box set that they're going to be releasing. And it's going to come out onto Kickstarter. And I have to say that, I mean, let me get this panel open. Now, it's almost as if the magnets are too strong. You have to be quite, I mean, that snaps, that snaps together. And it's very difficult. So usually I just kind of get an edge, he said. And then you tweak it and pull it. Very, very, very good, good magnets. Actually, look at this. They actually link through the side of the box. Not actually on, t I mean, that that's how strong, well, there we go. Now you can see how strong that is. You could slide them, I suppose. 
Anyway, each one comes with a nice little foam inlay, so even if you have the box open, your dice don't fall out too much. Can I do it that way? I can. So, yeah. Um, if you are interested in these, go onto their website. That's mastermonkgaming.com. Mastermonkgaming.com. And what you need to do is you need to sign up down here for uh, their newsletter, and then they will send you updates as to when this Kickstarter launches. Um, what I do like is the inset panel... Uh, which uh, it's perspex. It's not. It's not class. It's got their little logo on it. I don't. I don't think you can actually. No, you can't really see. There's a little dragon. Maybe that's better. There's a little dragon logo in there. I don't know where it sort of shows up best, but it is there. Beautiful little little inlay. It's perspex, and it's very nicely and securely held in place. So it's not going to come out. So that is. Monster Monk Oracle Dice Set. Very nice. Very nice. Um, and of course there are delays to shipping, as one might expect in today's troubling times. Uh, they haven't listed anything on their website about this, but that, that, that's... that's You can go have a look at the different wood types and things. They're absolutely lovely. Now these, these are perfect little gifts. And I do like their little signature, Wherever Adventure Takes You. Wherever adventure takes you. So there we are. They sponsored today's show. Well, they were part of the sponsorship of today's show. Um, so there we are. Okay, so we're talking questions. We are talking questions. And um, it's your questions. What are your questions about role-playing, about gaming? This is just a, a hangout on a Sunday. Normally before we'd all slog off to go to the, you know, giant factories and salt mines and, and places of work. Uh, on a Monday, but of course that changes as uh, as as the world has changed so far for a lot of places. Um, so yeah, if you've got questions, write the word "question" in caps at the front of your question, and then I will attempt to answer it. Okay, so let's see. Let us see where we are. Play that game says hi. Love your work. We need your templates to write an RPG video game. Well, that's awesome. Any advice how I can break? this down even more to script text. For example, act one, act two, false ending. Thanks, Jamie. Play that game. Uh, I can break this down even more for text script. Well, um, text script. I, 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 I'm a bit baffled by that. Do you mean as in how to write text within the game itself? Uh, in which case, all conversations should, in theory, have an introduction, a middle, and an end. Just as your adventure would have one as well. So that sentence, someone wants something badly, and somebody will be getting it, that should trail all the way down from the master plot down to each and every single character and the dialogue that they're saying. So when you bump into somebody at a supermarket in random, and even today, uh, well, not today, I mean, you should keep distance, but if you bump into somebody from a distance, you know, sort of walk past each other awkwardly. I do love that about about uh, this particular country that I'm living in at the moment, is everyone, you go for your daily constitutional walk around the park. And I'm very lucky to have this big park right next to the house. And uh, you're walking along and you see someone approaching you from a distance. So you sort of eye them out, you sort of you look at them very guardedly, you know, you sort of make sure they're not sweating or breathing heavily. And then you realise, well, that metric doesn't work because everyone's almost jogging. So they are breathing heavily and sweating a lot. So, oh, I don't know. And then you sort of work out, well, that's sort of a two metre or a six foot distance there-ish. So if I walk over there, and it works really well. You sort of get these these wonderful sort of duets happening as people sort of curve around each other. Until there's three people approaching, you're like, well, I can't go between those two. And I can't go between those two because it won't be more than two metres. And she can't walk through walls and he can't climb up the trees. So now what do we do? And so the two at the back slow down, the one in the front then does the curve and then you sort of zip through the middle of them. Anyway, it's a very interesting game that one plays. So um, anyway, if that weren't the case, we were stopping to talk to each other. Every single person that you have a conversation with would still have that sentence as their driving force. They want something badly and they're having difficulty getting it. Now, they might not tell you on the first question, oh, hi, my name's Jim. I'm really trying to get that woman to fall in love with me, but she absolutely, absolutely hates my guts because she doesn't like men. And I don't know how to overcome that. And you go, well, actually, it's time for you to move on. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is it, everybody has a goal. Everyone is driving towards something. And if that's going to help you with your scripting text, 
I hope it does. I hope it does. Um, okay, Desmania says, dice box or dice bag? Which do you prefer? Well, these these Master Monk boxes, I think, are awesome if you're traveling uh, to a convention <clears throat> one day, if you are being portable, if you kind of go to a friend's house to game or when we do go back to those those days. But when, you, when you're when traveling, these are really nice. I mean, they kind of hold the dice and they're not going to fall out and it's easy just to sort of pull one off the shelf and, and, and off you go. Uh, at home, I have... I'm not sure. Would you classify this as a box or a bag? This is something that I made and this has got some dice in it already that uh, I've been gathering since moving from from here. And it's it's... So I made this. It was out of a. It was a. Oh, the skeleton! You kind of you could buy a magazine every week, and you'd you got the jaw the first week, and then you got the face, and then you got the head, the the cranium, and then you got all the teeth separately, and then you got the spine and the rest. I didn't need the rest. I was like, well, I just needed the head, because you put a, a hinge on the back, and suddenly you get this wonderful sort of welcome to my lair. It always terrifies the lot of the players. Anyway, so I don't know. Is that a dice bag or a dice box? Um, not sure. Uh, but to be perfectly honest with you, I do prefer dice boxes uh, if one has to choose stuff. Dice bags are fun for keeping everything in. And I do have lots of bags as well, hopefully. They're coming from Japan. Yen Horseman says, how do you handle a siege adventure? Well, I have done a series of videos. I think there's three videos in total called Siege and how to run mass combat. Sieges are not a once-off adventure. They shouldn't be. Sieges are a protect, protracted, long, uh, almost mini campaign within your campaign. And don't look at the siege as, oh, go in and break the army that is besieging the PCs, or if the PCs are the sieges, just knock the castle down. And, and Sieges can be broken down into, go and find a weak spot in the castle walls. There's a traitor who's giving our secrets to the enemy. Go and find them. We're running out of food. Someone's poisoning the food supplies. We're going to find that out. Um, all kinds of adventures arise from a siege space. And um, there was actually a module that we did for our Patreons um, called the Siege of... I forget now what it was the siege of exactly, but it was a big siege event and there was a PowerPoint that we'd built with multiple maps and all kinds of wonderful things. But the idea is is that it's a single event, a single major battlefield, and then you have lots of little mini adventures in between sort of building up to the grand finale when there's a final battle or the siege is withdrawn because it fails or is, is, is ended for some some unknown reason. So that's that's something to look at. But yes, definitely, definitely go and check out those videos on the YouTube channel. You will find them there somewhere. Um, I think if you type in Siege, it'll be there. Hola to the great uh, Game Masters Vault. Nice to have you in chat with us. I hope things are going well your side of the planet. Um, so, yes. Uh, Angle RPG. Is it Angle? Angel? No, Angle. Angle RP. Angel RP, I don't know. Anyway, whatever it's meant to be. How do you run a proper session zero? I want to take it into consider. What should I take into consideration? How place all PCs in the same space without you are in an inn when PCs are not yet in a party? It's an excellent question. And the bottom line is, as far as I'm concerned, the PCs, your, well, firstly, your session zero should put the PCs into a situation already. This is not a, okay, guys, we're getting together to see how your PCs work together, and we're going to spend the next three hours just getting your PCs together. That, I think, is a mistake in itself. So if you are going to run, let's say, a fairly combat-heavy game where, where lots of combat is going to be taking place, I would start the PCs already as a group, and it's quite simple. You say to your players, all right, folks, there's a battle map done on Dungeon Fog or whatever. There's a battle map. Place your characters in the middle of that battle map. You've been trekking for the last six weeks through wilderness to get to the center of this temple. And you have now arrived at the center of the temple. The floor cracks open and plomp. Put down a monster in the middle of them. Throw some monsters around the edge. Get everybody to all initiative and go straight into combat. Let the combat rumble through. And then once the combat is finished... 
A, it'll allow the players to see, okay, this is a combat-focused kind of game or a riddle-focused game. or I mean, you can play it for two or three hours where you get them on this mission, and they might say, hey, what are we doing here? And you're like, you're looking for the withered heart of the necromancer of darkness. Okay, where will we find it? In the tomb of the necromancer of darkness. Okay, should we know anything? Yes, it is a tomb, and it was built by the necromancer of darkness. Can you give us some more? Yes, his first name was Pitch. Okay, what was his middle name? Black. Oh my goodness. And his last name? Darkness. Well, there we go. You asked, right? So I would start them right in the middle of the thick of things, get them going, because what that will often do is once they survive session zero and they get to the heart of darkness and they destroy it and you go, well, everything's done. It's all done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Okay, that's the end of session zero. Let's talk about our characters. Let's talk about what you liked and what you didn't like. I would also, if you are going to be doing lots of dungeoneering or if you're going to be doing combat with riddles, give them a riddle. So test out all of the basics that you're going to be using in your game. How do you know which of those are the ones that you should be testing out? Well, generally speaking, I don't have a lot of riddles in my games because it often frustrates players. On the other hand, if you look at the Wizards of Khanbari that I ran for the whole of last week, the guys got to a very simple door mechanism which could have gone either way. It could have gone that they spent hours trying to figure out what was going on, or, and this is what they did, they figured it out in three seconds flat. I had given them a whole lot of clues along the way they hadn't picked up on those clues at all, but they were sharp enough that when they were presented with the album, they went, oh, okay, well, we put the thing in the thing and we set it on fire. Bingo. Right, done. Thank you for playing. So, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the first thing that you do with the session zero, because what happens also is if the players had a blast and if they really enjoyed things going on and happening, your next question is then, okay, so that was session zero, now, when we start the campaign, if your characters aren't changing and if you don't want me to change up settings and, and those kinds of things, how do your characters know each other? Avoid, avoid. I have very seldom found a happy way where characters don't know each other and they all have to start working together. All that happens is a meta game slobber fest of okay well I'll work with your character because you're playing that character and I'm playing this character and we have to work together because that's how the game works just circumnavigate that entire thing throw them together and then afterwards say well how did you get together let them tell you that as a story let them work it out or go to the website and you can find the tables the relationship tables on how to establish relationships between the characters and go from there it really is as easy as that um, okay, Inshira Kankam Bawadu. I think you're new to the channel, or at least it's first, certainly the first time that you've asked a question. Welcome, well done, wonderful, awesome, thank you. I am a freshman in high school. Okay, I don't know what that is. I assume it's a junior, a junior person. We don't have that term here, but that's fine. And I'm going to be playing in my first actual one shot soon. Do you have any suggestions for creating your first character? For creating your first character, I would suggest that you create yourself as you wished you were. Now, this is not anything to do with deep reflection or anything along the lines of, oh, I wish I could run 100 yards without, well, if I could actually run 100 yards. Um, it, it really isn't something that you need to, 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 to worry about. When I say create yourself, it's a lot easier to create yourself or to create a, a character from a TV show or a book or a film that you really enjoy and that you think you understand quite well. When we first start role playing, the biggest separation that we need to establish, and I've seen a lot of very good role players who haven't done this, is the ability to say, well, my character chooses this because that is what my character is like. But as a player, I know that that choice is going to be very disruptive to the group. So I have to figure out how my character is going to choose something else and justify it for the character. That's if you if that 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 is the ultimate, I think, place for for players to be in. 
where they know they're playing a game, so they play the game and then they play the character within that game. But how do you get to that point where you can differentiate between what the character knows and what you know? I always advocate start with playing yourself as a peasant in that era. We've actually done it as a creative writing um, exercise on this very channel where you write yourself as if you were a fantasy character. It was a lot of fun, actually. Uh, I think I ended up settling on being a bard. Uh, I think that was what uh, we said YouTubers basically were. Bards, full of hot air, and basically that's about it. So the idea is that you create yourself. So are you more athletic or are you more of a thinker? If you're more of a thinker, maybe go with some spells and things. But again, magic can be awfully complicated and there might be a lot of expectation that you understand how those spells work. So I would create yourself if you were a warrior. Warriors might sound very boring, but they can be very, very, very useful as a first time player to get into the game because technically they are mechanically quite simple to play but they offer you the opportunity of seeing how the others are playing, seeing how your decisions are playing, and testing out your ability to play yourself. What would you do in that situation? Would you really go down that dark corridor, or would you wait quietly for someone who's, you know, heavier, armed, and, and maybe knows what's going on? So that would be my advice. And my second piece of advice would be to say, this is my first session, guys, so please forgive me. I'm here to learn not here to tell you how to do things and be open to their suggestions. If they say, well, you need to change this or do that, thank them, absorb it, listen to it, and then try and put it into practice for your next session. And of course, thirdly, just have fun. That's the bottom line. So let's see. Play the game says, how handle writer's block? So I know what A is, I know what C is, but how do I get B to work so well? Play that game. <clears throat> it's not, I don't think, it's a question of writer's block. I think it's a question of expectation block, or at least not using expectation to its full advantage. If you know where your characters are starting, and if you know what the end point is, choose either point, although the end point I think is going to be more effective in this case, choose the end point and say, well, what do I expect the story to have been to get to this point? The hero stands over the body of the fallen evil dragon. What do we expect happened before then? A titanic battle. Before then, the hero climbing in or getting to the dragon's territory. If we're really imaginative, it's actually happening in the hero's castle because the dragon launched an attack and the hero, and again, this is what do we expect, only got back in time to either see the princess be saved by them or the princess dying, or perhaps it's the prince dying, because we're genre changing up. Nonetheless, what happened before that? The hero couldn't get to the castle in time before the princess was killed. Why? Well, because the hero was trapped inside a dungeon. How did the hero get trapped inside a dungeon? He was lured there by the evil witch, who is actually the dragon in disguise. How did he get to the evil witch? Well, he was tracking down where the dragon's lair might be, and he had a green scale which he hoped the witch would be able to use to determine where the dragon was. Where did he get the green scale from? Well, that was with the Battle of the Ogres that he had because we needed him to get the green scale. How did he get a battle with ogres? Oh, well, he was trying to track down the person who'd actually assassinated the king and seems to be taking over the kingdom. That person left behind a red cloth and the ogres happened to be wearing red cloth armor. How did he get hired by the king to find the assassins who killed the king? Well, the king was dead, so he was hired by the vizier of the king to find the assassins with the red cloth. How did he get hired by the vizier? The vizier happened to be the one walking in the street when the knight, as a young scamp, ran past, tried to pickpocket him and didn't happen. Da, 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 da. So we can tell the story backwards or forwards just based on what do we expect happened before or after an event. You've got two events. That's more than enough to work forwards or backwards. If you're working backwards, you know where you're ending up. You know how you've got to get to the beginning. And there you go. So hopefully that will help you. I don't know what. what. Itchy. Anyway, um, Daniel Caro says, have you ever successfully, have you ever run a game successfully without combat? No, I have not ever successfully run a game without combat. 
I have run a campaign that has run over several months and multiple sessions where there was not a single dr blade drawn, there was no combat whatsoever. It was an oriental based game set in a fictitious pseudo Japanese styled uh, court and the players were basically one of them was the courtier from their home province trying to get the shogun to give their province favors and the other player it was only two players were was an attache basically a bodyguard for this character it was intrigue it was plotting it was double dealing it was tea ceremonies and the campaign was absolutely awesome until I decided to add in combat and as a result the combat simply overwhelmed the two characters and they both died and that's where the campaign ended so technically it was run without combat it was just ended with combat so there we are uh jared neff says q hey d r a c s i u r not e r u r r how do you run a chase scene if you are not using a grid or a mat how do you run a chase scene if you are using a grid or a mat? In my book, A Complete Guide to Nautical Campaigns, the suggestion was to use a grid when running ships, basically chasing each other in combat. That makes it incredibly and awfully boring. Incredibly boring. So very, 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 very boring. So we got rid of the grid completely. I never look at a chase sequence as oh it's it's to the to the to the square foot of distance who's running faster and all those kind of thing. Use those as guides to hit certain story points or certain skill check challenges. Never run it over an exact distance, in my opinion. If they're running and you want them to get caught, they can get caught. It's always a case of the cops or whoever's chasing them fan out and some manage to get ahead of the party and some stay behind the party and so the party runs into the middle of them and has to fight their way through and then escapes dramatically or is taken prisoner dramatically. If you want them to escape, let them escape, but don't let them just run off and the guards go, oh yeah, well, it's too far, I can't go there. Some guards might say that, but the others will try very, very, very hard and as a result, you should give the players challenges and checks, make it like a combat. It should ebb and flow. The characters get ahead and then they get to a dead end or they get a block off and then they've got to go back and then they've got to have a combat and then they've got to... So that's how I work it. And depending on how much fun the players are having, I would play it out over maybe three of those moments. So a skill challenge where they've got to balance over some floorboards that are creaky, a combat where they get stopped by a crowd who think they're the wrong people, and then some riddle or decision where do they go left, do they go right, they don't know which direction, either direction, the guards are coming, they go left, and they disappear into a hole into the sewer system, and the guards can't follow them because they can't fit through the grates, or whatever it might be, and now they're in a new situation. So always use it for leading them on and getting them to go in certain directions. That's my suggestion anyway. These are great questions tonight, by the way, folks. Wonderful, 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 wonderful questions. Um, <laughs> Mob says, Q, do you think it's okay for the DM to be much younger than the players? I have no idea what age would have to do with it. I really don't. Our ageist ideology is, as far as I'm concerned, antiquated. I have had games where I have had DMs who are a almost two decades younger than I am. And they have been absolutely thoroughly engaging and enjoyable GMs. Absolutely, they made some calls which I went, you're very young, you haven't lived life apparently, young man. That's not where you stick it. Um, but on the other hand, it was joyous because it was new and fresh and it wasn't the tried and tested old techniques that some of us old dogs happen to have. So I really don't think that that should be a problem at all. I think the biggest challenge that the the young GM might have is that the older players will use meta knowledge on how things work, especially if it's the more hands-on kind of thing. You know, the other day I was sitting with uh, my housemates here and, and um, uh, we were sitting around a barbecue, as a matter of fact, but an old-fashioned wood barbecue 
He had set the wood together and set it to light and built the wood into a chimney shape so that it would burn properly and create a nice hot center point to, to barbecue the meat on and that sort of thing. And we were sitting there and we were chatting and saying, well, growing up in Africa and in South Africa particularly and on a large farm and, and running around with wildlife and, and, and that sort of thing, we learned quite a lot of survival techniques and skills and how to build a lean-to and, and, and what to look for in terrain and a lot of things have changed. We also used to ride our bikes down the street late at night, well, late in the afternoon anyway, without a care in the world. Those things have changed and the kids and youngsters are now focused on technology, which I freely admit, and you will attest to this, I'm not very good at. Uh, it, you know, things slip up and, and oftentimes people go, but it's just right there. And I'm like, I can't see it. Where the hell is this blasted thing? And they go, well, you're not even looking at the right screen. And you go, oh, well, all right, fine. Grumble, 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 grumble. grumble. So our experiences and our training is changing. So a young GM might have that, where the older folk are like, well, yeah, well actually skin an animal backwards and never puncture the stomach, all those kind of wonderful things. Anyway, I don't think it should be a problem. And if it is a problem, then those older players simply need to get with it. There's no reason why a youngster can't be better than an elder in terms of telling a story. It's, that's, that's the whole point of this channel. Rant over. Matthew Pegden says, I have run out of tech space on my screen and so we'll have to scroll up. He didn't actually say that. How do I improve my dungeons and towns with regards to the pillar of D&D that is exploration? I would love my players to feel engrossed. Thanks for all your videos. Really appreciate it. How do I improve my dungeons and towns with regards to the pillar of D&D that is exploration? It's a good question. It's a good question. So I think that exploration, what does exploration really mean? It means to go to places that you are unfamiliar with and to discover new and strange and wonderful things. So with regards to towns, and this I think if you have not moved into a different city and a different culture, might be something that you're not too familiar with. But my favourite thing was to walk around, and I do it here in London, I did it in Tokyo, is to walk into a part of the city and go, right, GPS is off, I don't know where I am, I'm getting on this train and I'm getting off in five stops, and then I'm going to look around and see what's going on. And you wander around, you're like, good heavens, this is here, that's here, that's so awesome. I would encourage you to listen to what your players are saying after or before the session and to 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 hear them saying oh i really wish that we had a thing that did this or the next time they, they they're in a dungeon and they haven't planned something and they go oh we should have had a this or a that let them go into town and if they go exploring you say as you're walking past this alleyway you happen to to, to spot the strange glowing effect that's all you say don't give them more than that they have to explore they have to explore. So then they go, oh, all right, well, we'll carry on walking. It's on them. You gave them the opportunity to go down that street and discover the cellar of glowing crystals, which for a small fee of 400 gold pieces apiece can be theirs. And it illuminates to a 10 foot radius or a five foot radius and lasts forever and doesn't require fire. Uh, to, to be ignited and if put into this very very dark bag which is theirs for a steel at only 75 gold pieces it doesn't shed any light whatsoever it is up to us to make it feel like the players are going off and discovering these things and that we're not another thing that you can do and this is something that is fun and it depends on how good you are at improv is instead of planning out those kind of things before the game starts is to literally ask them what are you guys doing I have I don't know what's going on. Um anyway, it's not problems breathing. It's problems swallowing. Anyway. Uh so if they are busy walking in town and they say, Oh, I'm looking for someone who sells bear traps and you go, All right, all right. Um well, uh who do you ask? Oh, I asked the ironmonger. Alright, you ask the ironmonger. He doesn't sell bear traps, but he knows that there is a a trapper and trader of furs who is in the poor quarter of town and um, they just need to cross the brass, brass farthing bridge and that they can't miss him they can't miss him they can't miss him 
So now they're going on a journey, and they're going to explore, and they're going to find the town. So give them these directions. Figure it out as you go along. I mean, you've got a map of the city, and if you don't, you can get one, uh, or make one, or just make it up as they're going along. They really won't come back to the city and quote you inch by inch of what was and what was not. Make a note, Brass, Brass Farthing Bridge, Tanner, or Trader next door, and that sort of thing. So I, I would do it that way. It only is exploration if the characters think that they're going to a place or there is something that is promised at the end of the place that they are going to. If you just give it to them, it's not exploration. It's exposition, and that's boring. And I think that is actually the point I should have made right at the beginning. Never tell them what's there. Let them find out what's there by exploring and looking and engaging. There we go. Wow, gosh. Don't we wish we could have got there half an hour earlier. G Master says, I want to run a game where all the characters start as the children of servants in a castle. Do you think this is putting too much control on the player's backstories? I don't think it puts any control on the backstories of the characters. The backstories are entirely up to them. And I would say to them, OK, this is the game. You guys are servants, children in a big castle. You tell me what your kids' names are and who they are and what their stats are. And they're all level zero or whatever system you're using. Tell me the name of your parents and the position that they fulfill within the castle. These are the positions they could potentially fill within the castle. Your players will not know what positions could be filled within a castle. And if they do, they don't know which ones you want them to fill. So give them a list. It's not controlling them at all. It's the same as saying, I want to play a science fiction game. So put that to them. If they all go, what kind of adventures are we going to have as kids and as the ser kids of servants in a castle? I mean, we can't go where we want to. We've got to skulk around the back. That's for you to then step in and say, well, actually, you guys... You're going to be saving that castle from ruin and destruction. And that's all I'm saying. Ah, how are we going to save it from ruins and destruction? Well, you'll have to play the game in order to find out. So that's really where you should focus. Captain Pricer says, this is a technical one. What do we do if our question is longer than the chat box allows? YouTube has a 200 character limit, and I'm not sure what Twitch's is. I think Twitch's is a similar kind of duration. All you do is just write question part one or P1 or QP1 and then QP2 and I will string them together. Um, or, or, or just say at the end of question one, C-O-N-T dot, which is the old shorthand for continued. And then I'll see it later on. And if I catch the one, I will go and find the other one. I, it's a promise I make to you. Frenchy2195.6 says, how do I make a, a town... Feel alive without bogging down the game. The town needs to feel alive because it is alive. There's a wonderfully cryptic answer. When your players arrive in a town, how do you describe the town to the players? Do you simply say, you arrive in town? That's how a live town will feel. Dead. Silence. Awkwardnessness. But if you say, as you arrive in town, the fishmonger walks up to you, fresh fish, can't you fresh fish here? It's really fresh. It was only caught last week by my sister's brother half a mile away from the city that's 100 miles away from here. You push him aside. Lavender, get your lavender. You just run through it. Just make it come alive. A cacophony of sellers approach you as you wander through. Street kids with their scrawny little hands reached out towards you. Please, sir, can I have a cup of peace? I haven't stolen your coin pouch, but she is. All that sort of stuff. You make it come alive. GMs invest a lot of energy into their games. They should be investing a lot of energy into their games. That's why the burden of being a GM is so, so, so heavy, is that you are carrying this entire space. Once you have done your little opening pantomime of the city being alive or the guards standing at this very wet, damp gate that smells vaguely of goat dung and the guard glowers at the party as they wander through, but the streets are bare except for this mangy dog which glares at you with the same malice that the guard has before slinking away to find a slightly moist spot to hide in, the rest of the town is barren and desolate. It's up to you how you describe it, but you've got to put in as much energy as you can. 
and uh, bring that town to life. If you want it to be a vibrant market town, sell it as a vibrant market town. Uh, make us feel that it is a vibrant market town. Mikhail Hakami, or Hakmi, Mikhail Hakmi says, any news from the Guide to Nautical Campaigns hardcover edition and shipping under the particular circumstances we're living in? Uh, Mikhail Hakami, I was actually waiting for tomorrow to see what's going on. Um, we haven't heard anything from the printers aside from we have your money and now we will be printing your books. Um, we do know that the books will be primarily printed in the USA and somewhere in Central Europe for distribution globally. We asked if there were any delays as a result of this, but when we asked, that was two weeks ago, and we were told that there shouldn't be a delay at all. So they should be... Well, I should have got an email already saying that they have gone out. Now, I haven't yet seen that. I do know that there was a delay transfer in terms of the money that was on the beginning of this week, as a matter of fact. But that was resolved in the same day. So I will send out a blanket message to everybody. Uh, I would say tomorrow, but I've got to wait for America to, to go through its business day first. So it'll probably be on Tuesday. What's that? The 31st that I'll send out a big, a big announcement on that. So have a look for that. Uh, but yes, I, we are eagerly, eagerly awaiting absolutely eagerly awaiting that that because the moment it goes the moment we get them we then open up the sales of that that hard copy as well to those who didn't get it watcher 2417 says how many city guards do you have in a hamlet of a hundred in a village of 500 in a small town of a thousand in a town of three thousand in a big town of six thousand in a city of twenty five thousand you ask me these questions but it's okay because i'm a gm and i'll be able to tell you those answers straight away the hamlet which has a hundred inhabitants has two guards one of them is called Jin, Jin Longley, as a matter of fact. Jin is also the, uh, and happens to be, a lumberjack, very good and very skilled lumberjack, who has a particular fondness for pecan pie. Uh, his compatriot's name is Mitt. Mitt is not particularly smart, but he's very strong and does exactly what uh, Jin uh, tells him to do, and, and so that's that's the pair. There is no hard and fast formula because it depends on a whole lot of mitigating circumstances. Primarily, is that little hamlet of a hundred surrounded by very warlike goblin tribes, in which case every member of the hamlet will be fighting back, or are they in the middle of an idyllic flowing meadow that has miles and miles to the next large town, which happens to be an allied or controlling city, in which case they really just need two strong men to carry the drunks out of the tavern. And as the city gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so it does as well. It also depends on how rich the city is. So you might have a city of 6,000 or 60,000 inhabitants, but if they're not paying taxes or if they're not particularly rich, they might not be able to employ as big a number as possible. I did recall reading somewhere that one to a thousand was a good ratio to have. I'm not sure police forces to this day even have a one to a thousand inhabitants. It's an interesting question. Um, the closest I can get to in terms of a hard and fast number is I do know that there are 250,000 personal security guards employed in South Africa for a population of 50 million. So that number is definitely not one in a thousand. It's a lot, 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 lot bigger. So I, I don't know if that helps, but I, 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 um, I, would, I would base it primarily on your needs for that particular game. So if the PCs are particularly murder ho hobo-ish, increase the number of city guards to decrease the option of the players to kill everybody. If they really don't cause trouble when they go into town, does it really matter? Uh, oh yeah, we've got some time left. We've got some time left. Um, so Captain Mannix points out a good thing that uh, the Discord server, and I'll put the link in chat for you. So that's, uh, let's get them. There we are. It's in chat now. Discord.gm forward slash great GM. 
you can join us. There's, lo there's thousands, thousands of people and only three or four guards, I think, in total. Wonderful, wonderful moderators who keep that whole thing ticking over. I really couldn't. I couldn't do it without them. Uh, I don't do it without them. I don't. They do it all. They, they have the power. Yep, they do. They do. So I, I absolutely adore them. Uh, next question. Play that game. Do you have any videos or books on creating dialogue? Um, lots of videos on creating dialogue. Um, dialogue on the fly, I think the one video is called. You'd have to go and look for it in the vaults of YouTube. Um, it is there. Dialogue. Uh, NPC dialogue, it might be called as well. Um, that's there. Otherwise, you can pick up a copy of my book, A Complete Guide to Epic Campaigns which outlines a lot of stuff, and I think dialogue is included in there as well, well, certainly desires and creating NPCs that are useful or interesting or of value to the party, so that could help you as well. You can get a hard copy from blurb.com, or you can get the PDF from our website. If you buy a hard copy, send us an email, and we will send you the PDF free. Um, so there is that. Eddie Norman says... Oh, Edin Norman says, I'm thinking of splitting the party of four to two groups and have a pre-season one game where I go through how they end up in the same place. Do you think this is a good idea and how would you do it? Splitting the party into two groups and then getting them to come together is... It's mildly interesting, but unless those groups have disparate goals... I don't know what the extra effort is, is is needed for. So, again, going back to Wizards of Konbari, which is the live show that I run every day, uh, same time as this video, as a matter of fact, but Monday through Friday, there the players start and they're like, well, I'm the princess, oh, I, I serve the princess, okay, great. Oh, I'm a god and oh, I worship the god. So I effectively had two groups coming together. And why did they come together? Well, because... That's sort of because they came together, because they're all playing in the same game. So they kind of had to. Otherwise, they'd be playing two different games. Has it cropped up throughout the game? We've seen a little bit of favoritism, a little bit of favoritism of the PCs towards their group, if you like, but not a lot of that. They've just got on with it. So that backstory can be useful, and certainly they role play it exceptionally well. They're great role players. They keep referring back to it, and they use it as a driving force to 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 tell their story. But from a functional, from a GM's interference perspective, I I think facilitating it by saying, "Okay, it happened," is all that you need to do. I don't think you need to role play through that meeting. I, I because what's going to happen? Either they're going to come together and there's going to be conflict, which potentially could split the party in half and them going, well, I don't see why I would be with your character. Your character sucks. I hate them. Or they're going to come together and work well together. Gee, that was exciting. Crickets. Let's, you know, so I, just talk through it. Just talk through it. Get it over and done with. Pull that bandage and move on. Um, okay. Durkin says that question can be answered by Medieval Demographics Made Easy. Google it. It's a great resource. Medieval Demographics Made Easy. That's lovely. The biggest challenge, and I'm not, I'm not um, casting aspersions on this suggestion at all, Durkin. Uh, medieval Demographics Made Easy. If it's a resource and it shows you how many of this worked in a standard peasant village in the middle of, say, medieval France or... or, or somewhere in the Ottoman Empire, sorry, Ottoman Empire, uh, that's useful to a degree. It's useful if your campaign doesn't contain magic or divine power. The moment your campaign contains those two things, things start to change. Things start to change. And if you say, well, magic's very limited, well, then they don't change. Then they are very, very useful. But bear that in mind. Temper that. Um, certainly, when we were doing nautical campaigns, we referred back to actual shipping manifests and copies of things to try and figure out prices and how much stuff would cost. And we went, you know what? This doesn't actually work. It doesn't actually work because it's a fantasy game where we don't just have humans sailing around doing trading or human villages. We've got other races and they have different attitudes and we need to reflect that. So it's a good base, but don't don't confine yourself saying, well, in medieval villages, there were only four, four guards per 100 peasants, so that's all we're going to have. Don't constrain yourself to that. Use it as a guide. 
Use everything as a guide. That's it. Everything should be a guide. Um, so let's see. Warp Enigma says, I joined the Discord yesterday. People are really, really friendly. Well, that's fantastic to hear. Absolutely fantastic to hear. Uh, Game Master's Vault said, you can set up your stream deck to for social announcements. Yeah, I can actually. I need to do that. Social announcements. Well, I don't know if it'll post to restream directly. I'd have to check. I'll have to check. It's a good idea. It's a good idea. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, Enoch N says, when during the Big Bad Endgame's master plot, uh, when during that, should the players intersect with said plot? Should it be after the Big Bad and his allies have made significant progress with their master plot? It depends entirely upon you and what type of story you're telling. If the end game, if the big bad at the end, is a violent big bad like Darth Vader, we meet them as soon as humanly possible when they are almost ready to start doing their final minutia to take over the world. Dr. Evil, for example, from the Austin Powers films, Darth Vader, anything along those lines. Saruman was added in halfway through. We didn't even know about Saruman's plans in The Lord of the Rings. He was a big bad, technically. Not the big bad, but he was a big bad. And we didn't know about his plans until halfway through, when the character sort of stumbled into it and he was already well on his way to taking over things. So it does depend. If your if your villain, if your combat at the end is just big violence, it's glorious, glorious, glorious stuff, have them intersect straight away. Delaying it, oftentimes the players will be going, so what's the actual story? I mean, we've been doing these adventures and stuff and we really don't know what's going on. Where, where, when is there actually a plot? Because we haven't found it yet. You don't want that. You really don't want your players looking for plot. That's the worst, worst thing to have. It happens to me from time to time, especially when I haven't planned my initial, my initial adventure correctly. Um, you're going, I don't know what the hell's going on. Again, I would reference The Wizards of Konbari. It's a five-hour watch because each episode is only an hour long. In that one, in the first week or our first session, I established that there is definitely a dark force that is working against the space that the party is in. Their world is under threat by this dark force. We're going to find out next week. Spoilers. So if you are going to watch the show next week, block your ears. But next week, we will find out the name and shape that that force has taken so that our players have something to actively work against. So that's session two. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Okay, seven minutes to go. Seven minutes to go. Clive Doe says, what is your favorite system outside of Dungeons & Dragons? My favorite system outside of Dungeons & Dragons... I was going to say straight up the D20 Modern, but considering that D20 Modern system is based on the Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 version of the game, I guess that's kind of cheating. So I would say outside of that, outside of that, I would be forced to probably say Call of Cthulhu. Although the light version, which they've just opened up, by the way, um, an OGL license for, for all of Chaosium's products. So if you want to write Call of Cthulhu based adventures and things like that, you're free to do so. Uh, bearing in mind, you have to read all the terms and conditions that go with it. Uh, okay, Frag Kebab says, any tips for taking a group of immortal characters through a campaign spanning many decades of their lives? Well, firstly, nothing is immortal. If they're immortal, they're going to come across the problem that anyone who is immortal comes across. It's all boring. There is no... It's just boring. I can't die. So why am I going to do it? So you would have to have the most intriguing plot ever in order for it to... You would, there's no point in having combat except to determine time frames. Oh, you're being attacked by the police. Yeah, all right. How long does that delay us in terms of continuing? Does it give us enough time for the drug dealer to get away or not? 
drug dealer gets away while you're busy killing the cops because if you're immortal you can't die so if unless they have a a method of dying in which case then it also becomes quite boring because it's like oh you're gonna be killed by kryptonite let me guess every single villain that needs to be fought just happens to have kryptonite that they got on the black market for kryptonite selling because that's a thing it's very tricky very 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 tricky in terms of immortal characters now if they're vampires vampires are technically immortal but we know that there are many ways in which vampires can die and that to me is one of the reasons why they are very 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 enduring as a monster they've been around they're not very old they're not definitely not the oldest monsters in the book i think they're about 200 years old give or take uh, in terms of our our storytelling but we like vampires because they have all the immortality that they would possibly want. And yet somehow they just can't live for that long. Except for the super evil ones which live for thousands of years and then get flummoxed at the end because they forgot about the window which suddenly lets in the light. Uh, yeah, so we, we've got to be very careful about that sort of thing. But generally speaking, that's the way to go. Okay uh right black light quadruple x says how do i stop myself from overwhelming myself with the emotions of the character i'm playing i've been thinking for days how do i fix the situation my character left our party and and getting extremely angry at her parents black light the biggest challenge that we face as game masters is players not engaging with their characters the biggest challenge that we then face is when they engage too much. This is an intellectual exercise. And for me, that is why if you look at how the channel works, if you look at how it operates, it's always on a basis of these steps, these procedures. This is the narrative structure that we can follow. Because of that, it's an intellectual exercise. So you go, oh, this is what my character wants to do. It's going to be narratively interesting. It's because narrative determines that this is what the character should do. The love of their life has just died. And so they should be perishing too. When you start to become emotionally invested in your character, you need to step back and ask yourself, why am I becoming emotionally invested in this character? What is it that they are achieving that perhaps you can't achieve in your own life? I mean, it becomes deeply, deeply, deeply interesting from a psychological perspective as to how do we invest in these characters. And that, of course, is exactly what all Hollywood films are trying to do, is get us to care about the character and to, to invest in that particular character. But there is a distancing, because we're sitting here and there over there on that screen. In your case, my suggestion would be to, whenever you start to think emotionally about the character, is to step back and say, it is a figment of my imagination and my emotions are being affected by something I have created. I know it's difficult and I know it's tough, but oftentimes when people say, oh, well, just stop thinking about it. Oh, just do that. It's mind over matter. How does that actually realize? And in my years of experience, how does that actually realize is by you consciously stopping yourself going, no, stop thinking about that right now, because that's exactly what you're doing. Move away, do something else, go and mow the lawn, go and go for a walk, stop thinking about it. And, and, and so that's what I would do is if you are becoming emotionally entangled to the point that you are not are not able to differentiate or you suddenly get angry and that sort of thing, then that's the case. If, on the other hand, I've completely misinterpreted your question and you're just trying to figure out how to keep your character from getting angry with their parents because it's going to derail the plot, that's a very different story. And in that case, then it's it's really a case of saying my character does get angry with their parents but why don't they express it because i don't want to destroy destroy the plot yes i understand that but why wouldn't they express it maybe they 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 get super angry and something inside of them snaps and so my character's gonna become a barbarian moving forward i don't know i mean it's 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 that like i said it's an intellectual exercise about trying to figure out this is what should happen how can we get it to happen or how can we make it better in the way that it happens and prevent it from destroying the, the story itself. Uh, Darjeeling Stormforge says, what sort of catastrophe, maybe, maybe involving undead, in a tiny country would make its neighbors wall it off, but not outright destroy it? 
say, to still have access to its resources? Well, I think the challenge that you face is always that question of why didn't they just obliterate? Today's world, we have lots of countries that do things that we don't like, and some people try to build walls to keep them out. That doesn't necessarily solve the problem. So the idea of, well, we're just going to wall them in. I mean, the Chinese did it a very long time ago, and it did work for a very good reason. The culture on the other side had no idea how to get over it. It just didn't, it was whatever, right? But they didn't want anything in there either. They just didn't want to go there, and they couldn't be bothered to sacrifice people to go and kill them. So what you might find, the real reason, well, why didn't you go in and slaughter everyone? Well, we just couldn't be bothered. It was a waste of our resources. We might lose people in the battle. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. They're, they're, they're vermin. Wall them off and forget about them. Let them kill them. Let them kill themselves. In Game of Thrones, build a wall. They're on that side. We don't care about what happens on that side. We're not going to. We're not going to go in and exterminate them because it takes a lot of effort to do that. So that could be a very simple reason. It's just too much effort and the risk is too high. Don't forget, if the if the kingdom that walled them off has any kind of conscience, well, we can't just go in and slaughter a thousand or a hundred thousand peasants. That might be absolutely awful, but just let nature take its course. Just wall them off and forget about it. Uh, next question. 30 Socks says, I'm going to run a campaign. How are you doing for... Oh, we're over time. This is the last question. Ding, ding, ding. Time, please, players. I'm going to run a campaign in a grim, dark fantasy setting. The players are demigods slowly awakening their divine powers. However, because of a recent catastrophe believed to be caused by gods, most people will react negatively to anything divine. I'm afraid that this could prevent establishing positive relationships with non-divine NPCs. Any advice? So, why do you want them to be divine? in a divine hating world that to me is the real question because this is sounds like it's all your own own space that you're creating um so what do you want them to do do you want them to 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 change the perspective of the masses who hate the gods in which case then you need to get them to realize that people hate the gods because they blame the gods for the wrong reasons and that the gods are actually trying to help them by having sent down these divine beings. That's on the PCs to figure out that little balance. So I would have a mental character who is with the PCs, a little fat devil with a harp or an old sage or a young muse who likes rock and roll music. It doesn't matter. And I would have them say, you realize that everybody hates you. Because your parents caused this disaster, and now your parents have sent them to have sent you to come and clean up their mess. Well, you better do something nice to convince them that you're on the right side. So use that to guide the PCs to then start saying, "Well, all right, yes, the farmer hates me, and his wife threw slop on us because she cursed the gods. All right, we're going to help the farmer anyway." So I think you're going to have to really, 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 really work on that in terms of, of guiding the players down the path that you want them to go on. Um, and it can be tricky. It can be tricky, especially because you, you are driving this counter narrative for sure. But it could be why it could it could be a lot of fun to get them to to swing around whole populations and then to have a war halfway through because they've rallied enough populations to their cause that Oh, maybe the gods are not so bad. Yeah, maybe we'll fight for them. And then another faction is going to split off. I mean, that's the joy of religions is they can schism very easily. And then you've got a big war going on and the players are going to have to self-sacrifice to prevent the war from killing their own followers. It's lovely. And of course, they're going to build up more faith in the players than in the actual gods themselves. And so the gods are going to come down and say, well, you did a nice job cleaning up for us, but you're becoming too popular. Sorry. And you're not real gods. So we'll smite thee. Of course they don't, because they've become powerful enough to fight back to gods, and what a wonderful campaign. There you go. Hope that helps. I uh, Yeah, we have come to the end of our hour 
here. I don't know if Kaora is streaming. I've definitely got something. I've got, I, I don't know. I don't know. Don't get old, people. You get hair growing out of everywhere, and then it itches. Anyway, that's uh, probably an overshare, but I think sharing is caring, and, well, we're all friends here. So that brings me to the end of today. Thank you for your amazing questions. If I didn't get around to answering your questions, I will be back next week. Same time, same channel, doing the same kind of stuff. Hopefully not the same questions, because that could be quite dull. Tomorrow launches episode two, chapter two, I should say, of The Wizards of Konbari. Chapter one played out last week, and you don't have to have watched chapter one in order to be able to watch chapter two. Chapter one, if you watch it, you'll get a sense of the characters and you'll get a sense of the story. Chapter two, the story advances, but in such a way that you could jump in at any point. That launches tomorrow at 7 p.m. GMT, which is the same time that this show started and I hope to see you all there. Now, let's just have a look on Twitch and see if anybody that I know is on currently. I don't know why it defaults to that space. It's awfully irritating. Let's see. Who's doing what? Um, is Kaora on? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. This is sort of like his maybe, maybe stream day. Um, and, 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 does anyone else? No, no, it doesn't look like, uh, have I spelled it correctly? K, yeah, Kaora. No, he's not there. So encounter role players about to get hit by whoever we are going to raid them with. Uh, that's on Twitch. On YouTube, hit that like button. Um, if you like the live stream, hit the subscribe button if you want to get alerted when more videos are coming out. And more videos will be coming out this week because, well, that's just what we do. Anyway, until then, I wish you all a great evening uh, for a Sunday or a great afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Uh, until then, uh, goodbye. <laughs>